but um, we're on day seven today and uh, it's it's been a fabulous journey so far. We have uh, 23 excellent fellows in the room who've, um, who've, who've been with us along this journey and have contributed tremendously in terms of their uh, perspectives, in terms of their expertise, knowledge, and absolute enthusiasm, four hours a day. Um, and so that's how uh, Colab has shaped up. The dialogue series was planned initially as a way for our fellows to meet experts in the field and have kind of like a fireside conversation with them. And then as we started to get um, more programmatic about it, we realized that it was an opportunity as well for others um, in our community, in our wider community to perhaps engage with, uh, with some of the fellows as well as with the fabulous speakers that we were beginning to put together. And so that pretty much describes uh, what our dialogues are. We um, invite um, experts, we invite a provocator to engage a conversation between the experts, the public and our fellows um, all around this um, you know, around this field of art and technology or tech art as we've kind of clumsily put together. Um, today we have um, Irini. Um, Irini is the artistic director of Future Everything. It's a festival we followed for a while. They're very pioneering in what they've done and um, they really have been looking at this art, technology, society space for a long time. But Irini herself, has, has done this, um, this post is more recent to her, but her uh, trajectory has been a long and fabulous one to, to engage with, to see. She used to work with the VNA as the uh, curator, head curator for the digital uh, space there. Um, she continues to work with Mozilla um, as their curator for their MozFest. Um, she really does understand this field of technology and art and society in a way that very few people do. Um, Avinash Kumar is a um, fabulous creator himself. Um, he is one of those rare birds who uh, has an incredibly active practice and is somehow able to also support the field and support um, you know, larger platforms. This includes his design practice, Quicksand, his um, festival, which he represented, iMyth, which he started. Um, and, and uh, Blot, which has been quite inspirational to the um, audiovisual electronica art scene for as long as I can remember. And I can kind of, I, I go back elephant years, right? So, <laughs> so it's, it's uh, quite special to have both of them in the room and to make it absolutely special on top of all that cherry on top, as they say, is Shai Haradia. She um, is an old friend of mine, a fabulous, um, a critical thinker. Uh, she is the founder of Experimenter, which she started in 2003 um, and has built into um, international, um, uh, highly acclaimed international platform in um, film and video art. Um, and I think I've kind of uh, gone on and on. Uh, so shall I hand off to you, Shai? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, Kamya, did you want to say something? Put your hand up. Yeah. Now, just quickly, I wanted to thank our uh, supporters as well, Goethe Institute and British Council. They've done a fabulous job of helping us through this, especially in crazy times like right now. So, yeah, off to you, Shai. Thank you. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, that's quite, you know, that's extremely important, especially in these crazy times. So thanks, Archana and Kamya, for that wonderful introduction of all three of us. And uh, thanks for me, thanks for inviting me to participate in this dialogue on showcasing tech art. Um, and welcome everyone who is here and thanks for being here. Um, so I have been curating a festival called Experimenta since 2003, talking about going back elephant years, Archana. Um, and, uh, you know, so Experimenta signed in 2003, it's essentially an experimental film or moving image art festival. Um, it became a biennial in 2006, sorry, in 2007, um, so it happens once every two years. Um, and we're essentially focused on more single screen film and video exhibition and have occasionally dabbled with showcasing expanded cinema 
sound art, digital installations and things like that. Um, in fact, actually, I just, I'd like to mention that one of the most exciting and fun and DIY festivals we had was in 2009 at the first Jaga structure back in the day. Um, it was really one of my most special uh, festivals because we had like these multiple 16mm film projections on different layers of this crazy scaffolding and we built this um, black box with like cardboard for soundproofing. I mean, it was really, really special. And yeah, so thank you, Archana, again for that um, experience actually. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna really get into it about the festival, but I'm just gonna show you like a small short uh, promo film that will give you a sense of like the general vibe of the festival. Of course it changes with every edition as the curatorial focus shifts. But yeah, this will give you a sense of who we are. And um, it's kind of an old school little film, but you know, I'm sure it's old school in comparison to what we're gonna see later, but it's okay. We can kick it off with some old school vibes. Okay, so I'm gonna um, share the screen. Manan, help me if, just let me know if I'm okay on this, okay. You may have to share the, the computer sound as well, right? In the bottom left of your Zoom share screen window. All right, can you see the screen? Yeah, okay. जो अमीर को थोड़ा सा गरीब और गरीब को थोड़ा सा अमीर करते हम दुनिया बराबर करते हैं समझे तुम लोग सोशलिस्ट हो क्या Film experts. The previous flight's dynamic model, incorporating all the developments but without propulsion ducts, was built. I think it cropped the screen, but whatever. Okay. Um, okay, so I think that what we'll do is so that's basically just the general kind of quality of the festival. We had to show a range of things. Um, you know, we're constantly trying to question our notions of moving image art, what is experimental film. We are also bringing, you know, we bring in different practices, uh, both across mediums as well as across cultures. Um, so that's essentially the vibe, but I'm not going to take any more time. I think we'll move on to, um, and I'll invite Irini to the creative director of Future of Everything to present her work and her practice. 
Um, welcome, Irini. I just want to say that the, in terms of the structure, we'll both presenters will present for 15 minutes, then we'll have a brief discussion amongst us, and then we'll take questions. But feel free to put your questions into the chat as we go along, and we will attempt to address them the best we can uh, collectively at the end. So yeah, Irini, we shall, you can take over now. Thank, thank you, Sai, and it's uh, great to be here. Thank you so much, Artana, for the invitation, and great to see you, uh, Avinash, here finally. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking. This, this is such a great program, so I'm looking forward to to the outcomes uh, from yeah the fellowship. So yeah, so I'll just uh, I'll just start sharing my screen, and hopefully, hopefully you can see it. Yeah, can everybody see my screen? So. Um, I've just I've just used um, the title of a of a display that I did uh, at I curated at the VNA before I left back in 2018 uh, called artificial intelligence and I wanted to share this title because it's it kind of um, I, I used it just to kind of um, start with the idea of like how uh, the, the wording itself artificial intelligence kind of gives away the this fantasy behind you know how um, the, these kind of systems that we have constructed th thinking that um, sometimes that they might be autonomous when uh, or, or like intelligent when when they are not so uh, actually Matteo Pasquinelli and Vladem Joller in their um, recent work the noscope manifested which is a re which is a really interesting um, study and map. Uh, they they start with this um, with this argument and uh, and they go on to talk about uh, knowledge, but also talking about labor, etc. And um, so I would highly recommend to to check that. So um, as I, Arzana kindly said in here, great uh, introduction. Uh, I've been um, I'm currently based at the at, at Future Everything, which is uh, an arts organization and lab in Manchester, it uh, started life and run for many years as a fest as an annual festival, but recently we decided to uh, to change the, the format to move away from the festival format and uh, instead run events throughout the year. So we, which means that we um, we have like online platforms, but also we do exhibitions and uh, events anytime like throughout the year rather than focusing on a on a sing single uh, annual uh, event. So um, I just want to go back a little bit to the VNA and um, the work that just give some examples of the work that I was doing there. Um, my my background is also in curating and um, organizing and producing festival event and this is something that has been quite has a, a very long history in terms of media art as well and as in terms of uh, the most kind of popular format for showing work like this and of course it's something that we have been discussing a lot uh, over the years in terms of the challenges for uh, collecting for museums but also large organizations to collect and display long term or permanently uh, work like this which is quite um, challenging to maintain uh, but also to uh, yeah to, to keep kind of uh, always on etc and and also to kind of uh, preserve in in the long term so so i thought like uh, i said i started this uh, platform called digital design weekend uh, which was part of our digital programs um kind of uh, yeah regular kind of events uh, at, at the VNA as an opportunity to bring into a large organization and traditional kind of museum like the VNA uh, more kind of um, contemporary but also experimental work and also to to bring like practices that we don't often get a chance to see in uh, in, in like large institutions like that so um, obviously ideas um, around uh, artificial intelligence machine learning uh, algorithmic systems have been very central to the work that I was doing there and uh, a lot of the um, uh, the events and the projects that we shared and Digital Design Weekend was also very much about sharing processes not, so not just showing a final work but also to create an open space and um, for conversations but also for uh, practitioners to, pr to come and share uh, process and practice without uh, having the um, the need to to exhibit like final work, uh, but also it was about residencies and and creative exchange. 
So, so these are just some examples of work that um, I curated there like over the year. So um, the, the Diamantini robot that you can see was a project that um, is based in, uh, in Sydney University in Australia by artist Mari Velonaki and it was uh, back, it was shown back in 2012 and uh, it was a whole, um, the festival was dedicated to Alan Turing, um, the, the mathematician and uh, also like what many people call like, um, you know, uh, yeah, like a leading figure in terms of how we think about artificial intelligence and computers uh, today. So, so we had a lot of conversations about what human machine relationships and Diamant Diamantini was an interesting project because um, it was a robot that was constructed um, based on like, um, you know, female, um, like sculptures, like Renaissance sculpture or later. And um, the artist Mari Velonaki wanted to give it this kind of, um, you know, like very fragile form in a way, but also it had a, a lot of uh, open, uh, pro like an open process in terms of being, we had set up a lab in the space, in the museum for the team who came over from Australia to work with visitors and think about um, interaction with visitors. So how Diamantini as a robot would kind of uh, perceive like visitors or like how visitors would perceive Diamantini and what the, the gestures would be like. And um, the other two images like uh, Slave Master by Studio Bria and Alexander Whiteley and Memo Acton's um, a pattern record, uh, yeah, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the dance performance were presented at later stages. And uh, again, they involved uh, machine learning and kind of training, uh, training machines like to, to uh, follow or um, respond to, to human um, kind of movement or uh, yeah, or like the dancers in, in this case. And just to, to go back to that display, uh, one of the works that I had included, the artificially intelligent display, which I find really uh, interesting and also quite um, uh, revealing in terms of how what, what is behind the systems, but also uh, it kind of influenced a lot how I, I was thinking and uh, worked, uh, is uh, Vladim Yoler's and Kate Crawford's Anatomy of an AI system, which I'm sure most people have seen now because it has been exhibited very uh, widely, but the um, the examples that I wanted to share here today are because there, of course, there are so many artists that are working uh, in really interesting ways with um, uh, training, um, like algorithms and machine learning, but also uh, data and uh, AI. I, they 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 work like in so many different ways, and uh, and and it's great to see artists experimenting uh, with these technologies today. But the examples that I'm sharing here are kind of more reflecting the type of work that we do also at Future Everything and the work that I, where I come from, which is quite, um, which is focusing on critical conversations about how these systems have been adopted uh, quite widely in society and how they've been influencing the way that we perceive the world around us, but also the way that we perceive each other and how we are seen like by the systems. So, um, so if you want a kind of transition like to a different kind of um, yeah, way of, of doing and, and governance as well. So anatomy of an AI system is a large map and also a, a study and research behind it, which is um, divided into three parts, like the birth and the life and the, the death of, uh, of an AI system, in this case, uh, Amazon Alexa. And it's really interesting because it goes into all of the uh, architectures and structures that are surrounding a system like that. For example, the, uh, the, the, the labor, the conflict minerals, but also data privacy issues. And of course, in the late, the death stage, uh, what happens to devices like that and, um, and the, the, the geological kind of processes as well. And the reason why, I, I, as I said before, like the reason why I wanted to, to kind of share these works is that, Part of the work that we do is exploring critically how um, a little bit like the um, paradox of um, of these technological systems that have on, on one hand we thought we think as changing the way that we do things and um, as being transparent and like accessible but then on the other hand they create a different uh, form of um, 
bureaucracy, like a digital bureaucracy that is hidden and it's um, kind of invisible in a way and that doesn't, and it kind of gives different types of privileges to, to people depending on where you are. So just a few examples from, um, and also I, Shai and Artana just to remind me about the time and when, if I'm running late, because I know I only have 15 minutes. Yeah, you, you're good. You've got like about five, seven minutes. Sorry. Okay, okay. So, so this is a, a recent uh, project by Rafael Lozano Hemera that we presented uh, with um, at Future Everything with Manchester International Festival and Science and Industry Museum. And uh, it was shown uh, last year in Manchester. And it was a large scale um, installation where uh, it, Rafael explores ideas of surveillance, but also ideas of, face, of, of voice recognition and uh, facial recognition and, um, and the idea of atmosphere as uh, after like Charles Babbage uh, kind of say, it, it, it's like a library that uh, holds everything that we have ever said. So, so it was an interesting space where you became aware of like how visible you are in, in, in current society. And um, just a, a couple of more examples that uh, deal with these ideas of like privacy issues, but also how we are seen by these systems is uh, Mousson, Zeravid, Dan Stavi and Aaron Weisenstern's work, The Normalizing Machine, which is uh, thinking about like this, what is normal in society, the social normalcy and how our face is kind of um, categorized, which is something I find really interesting in, in, in the times of, uh, facial recognition that takes us back to the physiognomics and this kind of backwards, but also quite um, like now forgotten, but actually not the, so, so forgotten kind of uh, way of uh, categorizing people based on their facial um, characteristics and something that criminologists have been using and is coming back with facial recognition. And um, Anna Riedler is, is another example of a, a really influential and brilliant artist that um, I, I, I've, I've followed and have worked with. Uh, and of what I find interesting is here, in her work is how she kind of thinks about the data set. And one aspect that I find really interesting is the, the hidden labor behind the system. So the hidden labor in categorize, categorizing data, large data sets, which she does uh, on her own and by hand. And uh, Lauren McCarthy, uh, this work uh, is called Someone, which um, we presented at Mozilla Festival uh, last year, um, in, uh, which, which is a, it's a, some sort of a performance where she has set up uh, software in, at four places in, across the US and people, visitors in the gallery are able to uh, kind of, they take they take the form of a human Alexa, if you want, and then they can control different uh, things like lights, music, etc., at people's homes. So again, these these two I find really influential and interesting in terms of how they think about hidden labor uh, in their work. And I just wanted to share a few kind of critical texts and survival toolkits, as I call them, that have been really interesting in terms of um, thinking about these issues from race, but also labor uh, and gender um, and the, how this kind of uh, like how bias are kind of reproduced and uh, in, in algorithmic systems today and also but also what kind of tool is how we can rethink and reframe these systems. So unbiased is a really interesting piece that thinks about decision making, but also a algorithmic uh, bias. Uh, and obviously, you, you, you probably are aware of Joy Bolamini's work in Algo Algorithmic Justice League, which is really interesting and has been doing a lot of important work in, in terms of thinking about how algorithmic systems impact on uh, uh, yeah, specific communities uh, as well. And just finally, to go back to our work at Future Everything, uh, this is uh, another piece we, we often kind of the way that we kind of develop how um, how we work, as I said, we, we work across different uh, formats and uh, events. Um, this is a project by Naho Matsuda, which came out of a long sort of residency or artistic development program, which was running for two years. And um, Naho Matsuda was uh, a, an emerging artist, young artist, and she took part in this program. And then this uh, Everything Every Time, which is a, a public sculpture um, that works with data sets, like with, with um, yeah, data feeds from the specific location where it is uh, placed. Uh, and it kind of um, tries to uh, 
make this invisible data into some sort of poetry statements about the city and the state of the city where it is um, exhibited. She, she, she created this piece during this program. So we try to uh, work very closely uh, in collaboration with artists, but also other organizations, uh, arts organizations, but also industry to have this um, cross-sector uh, conversations uh, about, but also help artists to, um, to create new work and uh, create partnerships. And we find really uh, important the, the fact to have, to, en to involve um, a tech industry in this um, conversation. So that if we are talking about data uh, ethics, if we're talking about AI and the impact in society, then it's really important that we open up and we kind of have these wider conversations and art can be uh, a catalyst in um, involving in making this happen. And just finally, I just wanted to share our a program that we kind of um, decided to launch during the, the lockdown and the pandemic, uh, which is um, called Future Focus. And it's, it's a platform that enabled us to uh, move these critical conversations, but also artistic exchange and hopefully residencies in the, in the, in the future online. And Future Focus has been a program that has been running uh, almost every month. And it's in a way responding to crises and challenges, not just the, the current pandemic, but thinking about like longer term challenges in terms of uh, algorithmic systems and um, digital bureaucracies, but also thinking about environmental change, uh, about a financial, like, yeah, like e economic kind of challenges, but also humanitarian challenges as well. And I think that was my last slide. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop Super. sharing. Cool. Um, thank you. That's the azan that you can hear behind me. I'm assuming you can hear me through over that. Um, so yeah, thanks, Rini, for that. I mean, it's really interesting to actually uh, look at your work around, uh, um, you know, the critical conversations that you're trying to generate through your work at Future Everything. Uh, um, and I think we'll address and try to address and pick up on some of the points that you raised, which I think are quite important for all of us involved with the exhibition and, uh, you know, curating festivals. So we'll move on to Avinash. Um, Avinash, it looks like you're good to go, so you can take over. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Irini, and thanks, Arjuna, for having me here. Uh, looking forward to the questions after this. So I'll dive right in. I, I'm going to go at a much faster pace than Irini because I haven't prepared as well as her, but I'm just going to also go through my plan was to not talk too much about artificial intelligence and machine learning, and but kind of give the perspective uh, from a larger sense of what, from my perspective, what trying to be the curator of a emerging media art festival in India means, and possibly look at the new media practice in in general. Um, so starting off, what I want to share with you basically three documents: one from our 2016, 2017, and 2019 festivals, and that will maybe set the stage for stuff that I'll speak about. Um, so what you're seeing right now is uh, something we did in 2016. Uh, just to give you a really quick background on IMET, uh, Media Arts Festival, the name itself is borrowed from uh, an iconic film made by the experimental filmmaker Stan Brokach. Um, and, you know, I have a background in DJing and electronic music, like Archana mentioned. And back in the day, in 2012, we actually started the festival as what we would, were calling a visual music festival. And in 2016, we had this opportunity to work with the Japan Media Arts Festival or JMAF, which is one of the oldest running uh, media arts festivals in the world. And the idea behind this collaboration was to bring in some amazing Japanese talent. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through it a little bit and mix that with Indian talent, uh, as well as a, 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 a little bit of talent from the UK. Um, and a big part of what we try to program as a festival, again, just to highlight the fact that media arts as a discipline or new media in general, obviously is, in general is a contentious medium because nobody really has a clear picture of what it is. And especially in the context of India, um, it's a very emergent term in itself. So for us, the process of creating a media arts festival is also the process of discovering what media arts means for India. And as you can see in some of the work we tried to bring in in the first year of doing this itself uh, as an exhibition beyond a festival, we tried to bring in various kind of projects. So this one, for example, is by the electronic music uh, artist Sprike and the artist Big Fat Minimalist from Bombay. On the bottom right, you have this amazing installation called Forest of Daxophone, which is like this immersive installation in which you walk in to this old film studio called Sitara Studio. Uh, 
risk is almost full. That seems to be a perennial uh, situation. Um, we also brought together uh, some really interesting kind of, let's say, retro tributes on the left, for example, from this great uh, small organization called Lightcube, and they brought in uh, this uh, curated a selection called Glimpses of Indian Animation, which was kind of recounting some really old works, including fil I think from the film board uh, of India. Uh, we also brought in some indie gaming, uh, as well as kind of really bringing in some projects, like on the bottom right is actually a project that we did called Bioscope, which is just literally a street new media artifact, literally on a cart built to be standing on a street of Bombay. I'll at the same time, we brought in some really high tech work, like on the top right, you can see this a uh, project called Neural Portraits by uh, the very famous new media artist from Japan called Daito Manabe, um, as well as looking at a selection of films from Japan that really brought in a lot of work, which was extremely uh, kind of high. And just to kind of skip back uh, uh, one slide on the middle here, you can see this really interesting project called Handy. Again, this was actually a bionic arm project uh, and really cutting edge technology and this was placed next to again a fairly Indian vernacular new media work and for us I guess the festival curation really reflects what we see in India around us which is obviously a lot of uh, clash if you say clash aesthetics in a way uh, and this bridging of old and new and so on and, and for us bringing Japan and India together represented the same. Uh, we've also programmed given our roots in electronic music a big part of our programming uh, has always included electronic arts in general, especially performative arts. And here we had uh, this amazing band called Galsid and uh, Hitachi Saito uh, from Japan who were a popular dance music act. Um, we also did a small retrospective of Indian animation separately uh, and also brought in uh, you know, content from the UK uh, through the British Council, like the McLaren Awards. Uh, later in other editions, we also brought in work from the BFI and so on. Um, and we also brought in some really interesting anime. Um, and one of the other things that we do with the festival is to try to locate uh, media art inside old Indian establishments. So this one, for example, is an amazing performance on the daxophone, which is a very uh, little known and little practiced instrument. Uh, uh, and this was performed at Edward Theatre, which is this 150 year old theatre in Bombay. And right now only used for like, you know, this B-grade films uh, in the daytime. And we kind of took that over and it's a beautiful, really beautiful space. And for us, that conjunction of presenting media arts inside old film and media environments like old studios and theaters is also a very exciting part of the festival for us. Um, and this is again, another performance at the same venue. Uh, on the right, we did this really interesting gig. That's me, uh, VJing uh, with uh, my colleague Sprite. And this was a, um, a gig called A Psychedelic History of Video Games. Um, which we kind of use uh, as a way to tell the story of video games from the 60s and 70s and 80s onwards. Um, we also did a whole lot of workshops and typically that's also something that we love to do, uh, much like Archana's trying as well with her festivals and all the other works, wonderful works she's been doing over the years. And we really believe that in India, festivals need to be not places where you just showcase amazing looking work from the best talent out there, but it's also a place where you teach people, where you educate and share, and also uh, festivals in India, I really feel need to be starting point for new projects and starting point for really important new collaborations because we're really in, in a very nascent stage uh, of the media arts kind of ecosystem. Uh, and again, yeah, just to kind of highlight two of the venues here, one is Sitara Studio, one is Edward Cinema, both really iconic venues uh, from the Bombay scene. So I'm just gonna share Sorry, I'm going between different uh, presentations, but hopefully it'll be fast enough. Um, so skip to 2017 and we kind of like essentially built in um, uh, different kind of components again, but broadly along performances, workshop showcases. And uh, this time the festival happened in Bombay at uh, primarily at a venue called ISDI, which is a design school in Bombay. And a big part of the, of the festival this time was something called the Guild, which was essentially short form for Virtual Reality Storytellers Guild, which uh, is something that we were kind of, again, going back to this idea that festivals need to be places for education. We also, given my own experience in the electronic music scene, where you realize that in India, anytime something becomes a little bit trendy, the minute that's also the time when all the brands come together and start supporting that medium. So let's just look at electronic dance music for, uh, for instance, the astronomic growth of that medium in the last, I would say a decade 
is immense, right? When I started DJing, we used to have we used to have to hire a projector from our own money to convince the venue that we should do visuals. But today, you 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 cannot miss any. I mean, no club or venue or festival goes without visuals. And uh, what I learned from that was that while that kind of astronomic growth in India is important, it also takes away some of the natural curve and the natural evolution that let's say. I mean, not to compare India and America or Europe, but there's just a longer curve around, let's say, media arts. Uh, and so our idea was that let's return to the idea of a guild and bring together people. So in this case, in our guild, we brought about 30 people over a week, uh, exposed them to the current trends in VR, exposed them to the latest hardware, software, brought in mentors from Australia, the UK, as well as India, brought in you know, game engine guys like Unity, uh, hardware guys like Alienware and just jammed all of this into a group of 25 to 30 people who went on a crazy chase of one week to go from idea to a, a project prototype as well as, uh, I mean, basically a VR prototype as well as a pitch presentation where we brought in funders and we brought in like uh, audience. Um, and the idea here was to see if we could seed projects that could find funding. So these are like six of the projects that came in again, Part of the uh, idea here was to kind of work around socially relevant themes for virtual reality. Um, so we kind of, again, there's a Mozilla in there and we kind of looked at, uh, again, there, there was a really nice take on Vikram and Vital in VR. Uh, on the right is something, a film that actually came out as a funded film after this uh, on, on climate change in India uh, uh, with Purpose Climate Labs. Uh, and kind of the growing reason for concern around pollution and so on. So a big part of this kind of exercise was to really say, can we do the entire matchmaking cycle from uh, around the ecosystem of VR and come out with projects and teams that have a six month window. Uh, so out of the six projects, two of them got funded uh, in a fairly healthy manner. And those are parts of their, uh, those people's portfolios right now. Um, the other thing we did in this festival was to kind of look at uh, augmented reality as, uh, so this was called the AR Street Art Crew because this was done in collaboration with the START Festival in Bombay. And as you guys might have seen recently, if you follow their work, they've been experimenting a lot with AR and maybe this was one of the kind of points where that uh, sort of seed got uh, born. Um, and here again, we brought in about 30 people on the topic of augmented reality. We had like a five day workshop in parallel to the VR one. Uh, my team at Quicksand as well as several other experts uh, worked on this. We introduced people to, you know, obviously simple things like paper prototyping, which often is a very undervalued tool uh, when people start working on tech uh, and kind of tried to take on this very physical approach to augmented reality and tried to bring in the screen and the tech right at the end. And then we had a little exhibition again around this. Um, the other part of what we've been doing is to create these immersive media showcases, which are essentially VR film festivals for the last like four or five years. And here we try to bring in uh, films from around the world, award-winning films. So people in India, especially creators, can get a better sense of what some of this stuff means. Uh, and finally, uh, we also did a really interesting small art exhibit where we invited artists to imagine uh, media arts and technology, but imagine them in kind of an alternative history mode. So kind of go back into different eras of India and try to find uh, interesting kind of artworks and ideas that can blend this idea of retro, futuristic, Indian immersive media. Um, and there were some really interesting examples that came out, uh, as you can see here as well. So, for example, this one on the middle here is the Kerala dance of Tayyam, which is obviously a very spiritual, metaphysical dance form. And the artist here, who's also from Kerala, chose to interpret it as a way of uh, it being so different and far out that it she created uh, an extraterrestrial story around how it got introduced to Kerala. Um, and finally, we also did a conference where we brought in some really interesting perspectives from around the world. From the UK on the right is uh, someone that Irini might also know uh, that then from Invisible Flock. Uh, and uh, uh, in the, on the second uh, is Mark Atkin from this amazing studio called Crossover Labs in the UK. Uh, we also had a bunch of Indian experts and so on. So this was kind of, again, as you can see, how the program's evolving, we kind of trying to make it bigger as the years go on. And then obviously we brought in BAFTA film screenings from the British Council. I think one of the things we also learned, which is also interesting from a programming point of view is that there is so much new media content out there in the world. And a big part of doing a festival like this is also to create those linkages to present uh, those perspectives. And I think one of the mistaken ideas around new media is that it's new uh, and, and in terms of chronology that it's recent. And, I definitely feel that 
that's not true at all. And as a festival, we feel like anything's game from pre-cinema and, you know, we've shown stuff from the late 1800s right up to like the year we're in. And for us, all of that is new media. All of that is media arts. It's about how you see it and it's about the value that you see in it and how you apply it to your present circumstances that makes it uh, new media. Um, and finally, we also did a whole lot of kind of immersive performances. A big theme of all our performances over the year has been the confluence of audiovisual artists and trying to find that liminal space where the audiovisual medium of club performances stands as its own medium. Uh, it stands apart from cinema. It stands apart from dance music on the club. It stands in a separate space where, uh, which is obviously very unique and, and, and that's kind of something that we've tried to recreate. Um, and finally, we've just also video games has been a big theme. And, and at this particular time, we also brought in the folks from Red Bull Music Academy and this amazing artist called Soichi Tarada. If you've ever listened to his music, who's uh, basically a pioneer in the video game scene, He's, uh, his music is uh, on some of the greatest titles from Japan uh, in the 80s. Um, and he was here as a mentor, showing his process, also sharing his new work, and also performing for us uh, with his new dance music team. And we created like an 8-bit theme venue and, and you can see the televisions at the back and uh, we did some work. Again, an interesting application where we were working on a platform called Touch Designer, but again, rooting everything into televisions and those are actually projection mapped onto these old televisions and things like that. So this kind of a old new kind of a mix. Um, and finally, I hope I'm not rushing too fast, but just to give you, leave a little bit time for uh, discussion. Um, and finally, just to quickly skip to, uh, well, this year, unfortunately, what's the date today? 28th. So yeah, so we were actually supposed to start IMIT Festival day after tomorrow, if things had gone well uh, in Bombay, but obviously we're not doing that. And we've not, uh, we've tried, oh, sorry. We've tried to like avoid uh, doing a digital festival right now, even though it is very tempting. So hats off to Arjuna for uh, kind of thinking through it. Let me just, yeah, okay. So this is again, just a quick sense of how the festivals change and we can also talk about in a way using this blueprint. So this is last year, 2019. Um, again, not to get into too much of IMIT, but also just a quick shout out to some of the partners we've had. These are obviously not all the partners we've had, but uh, obviously British Council, Pro Elvesia, the Goethe Institute not mentioned here, but otherwise extremely important for us. And that again is obviously a whole different conference topic around cultural funding for new media with Arshana would be pretty familiar with the struggles around. Uh, so hats off to all of these partners for supporting us. Um, so here again, uh, just to quickly skip here, I think one of the really key ideas that, and it was kind of a humbling idea uh, and we were disappointed by it in the beginning, but it, it's something we uh, have uh, kind of grappled with in a positive way, which is just to say that after doing this many festivals, we realized that as a festival organizer, to sustain a festival of any sort in India is an incredibly arduous task and I, I have you know, full respect to any festival organizer of any sort in India who's managed to pull off a festival for more than three years, right? Now we've been doing IMIT for about seven, eight years now, along with another festival we do called Unbox, which is in its 10th year. And with media arts, we realized that one of the key things is that what we were trying in previous years was to create with, I mean, uh, curate with the idea of what we had in mind, what new media is, but we kind of totally forgot and overskip the fact that in India, there is actually no public notion of new media. There is no public notion of media art. So it's actually incredibly hard to create these really expensive, time consuming properties, but then actually have less resonance because there's just not an audience for it. So we decided let's start again. And let's start by actually creating a conference, which we've never done in IMIT. And let's start at the foundational level. Let's build an audience. Let's work together. Let's share stories. And then let's build an amazing new media festival on top of that in the years to come. And with that in mind, we created a conference called Massive Mixer. And these are the kind of the 10 broad streams for it. And I just wanted to quickly show you a few of the kind of ideas that are kind of running and also some of the people um, just kind of, I'm just going to uh, stop. Avinash, I think, sorry, I think yep. you have like a minute. <laughs> okay, no problem. I, I'm not going to take more than that. Um, so this is just again, a quick glimpse at the variety of programming that came together at this conference, almost 50 plus speakers looking at very, very different topics uh, and quite relevant topics and topics that really brought together India and the world. We had a great mix of Australians, uh, uh, people from the UK, Europe and India. Uh, and obviously looking at code futures, which I guess it's related to the topic today and this whole idea around what algorithmic creativity means for India. And we looked at the web, the game engine 
and at uh, modular kind of synthesis of audio visuals. So I'll kind of stop here uh, and just with a kind of end note with the fact that, uh, again, like I said, for us as a, as a festival, uh, while there's a lot of programming around that we've done, the heart of it is that for us, we, like I said, we're really trying to start at a foundational level and try to discover what media arts means for India. I think that's far more important than uh, ascribing to any global trends. Or that's far more important than working on the best hardware, on the best software, or working with the best talent around the world. It's really important to understand what technology means to India, what's the relationship between tech and society in India, and what are the various forces that are shaping it in the future. And so for us, we're really at ground zero right now with this year's festival being called off. And with COVID, I think we're really at ground zero and trying to rebuild the festival in the years to come. That's it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Avinash, for um, sharing the range of work that you're involved with. And I want to just take off from actually what your, was your final point um, and to just get right to it, which is um, I'd like to address kind of the obvious situation of us talking through this screen, you know, um, in this uh, COVID era and where technology of this kind seems to have come to the rescue, but yet ironically, as we all know, it can never replace the experience of us being physically together and sharing and discussing and experiencing art together. Um, I think the situation will seemingly continue for another year at least. So where does that leave our festivals and exhibitions then? Um, of course, going on, online is a way forward, but what does that do to the experience of viewing and interacting with the work in a site-specific sort of way? You know, um, for me personally, I value the social contract that we make with each other as an audience in a cinema coming together, for example, to collectively view something. Um, and I'm not a fan of the digital viewing individually at alone at home format that most film festivals have done too recently. Um, so I want to ask you both, what are your thoughts, concerns, ideas um, on exhibiting now in this COVID era? I mean, how is audience reception and engagement um, in the artwork any different via online platforms? Um, and does that matter at all within the context of showcasing tech or media, media art? I mean, is it fine for people just to be looking at a screen anyway? Um, and uh, how does your role as a curator change in this current scenario? Um, is there a universe in which tech art does not need to be exhibited in a physical space? Um, and can it only work through screens? So we are liberated from the complexities of exhibiting in a physical space. So these are just some of the questions I wanted to kind of put out there. Um, yeah. Because I'm kind of grappling with some of these questions in terms of work, you know curating an exhibition um, and questioning where one's own practice, curatorial practice is at, you know, in this kind of scenario. Um, so yeah, either one of you can take it or Irini, if you want to yeah. go, because you've already, you're doing something right now, right? So yeah. I guess it's scheduled. So how, what, is, what context are you working in then? So um, I guess we're, we're still, obviously we had, we had to rethink and uh, rescope like most of our programs and we are not um we we don't think in any way that we we are going to go online from now on we still need to we feel that there is a, a big value on like physical events and it's it's different experiences that we can't you know it's a, that we can't compare but what we're trying to do is to to find ways to bring both worlds together so that we can create, I mean, um, having the chance to work online at the moment has been really um, amazing for us because it helped us to keep our networks. It helped us to um, yeah, run events that we were, we wouldn't have been possible. It wouldn't have been possible to run otherwise. But also we realize that there are encounters that you have in physical spaces that you can't have online. You can't, you know, there are people who still have no access to the internet, for example. and how do you engage with these people so we have tried like different ways even like uh, you know just um, doing like taking part in like youth engagement programs where we use the post and send uh, like you know designed postcards or other material but also trying um, I don't know like the people have tried uh, there are really amazing examples of people who have used from uh, whatsapp texting to kind of you know other 
uh, like old media as well to communicate. So we are just trying to have a, a different like way of thinking about that. But also another thing that makes us kind of consider is like what what exhibitions are for. And so to reconsider like all these ideas of like, you know, um, rushing and creating artworks that are an object that you put in a space and what happens after that. So what about processes? What about critical conversation? So it's kind of, you know, it, I think it, the current situation helped us to, to reflect on how we've been working so far and how we can break some of these systems and then creating new ways of engaging. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree totally. I mean, I think we're in a very similar state uh, as a festival, as well as maybe an individual uh, curator or a creator as well as myself and my colleagues. I feel like in many ways, it's been a, obviously a very interesting journey over the last six, seven months. And uh, I guess it's echoed by many people where it kind of starts off with this crazy excitement that this is a time to incubate new ideas. Everyone's wanting to work on their next album, their next immersive piece and their next thing. And then in two, three months from March, Jan, Ju you know, April, May, it's just like dipping, dipping. And then finally, right now, when you speak to creators, a lot of them just admit that they couldn't do it, right? They just couldn't do it. Uh, it they didn't get that energy that they needed to complete things or, or to think through things. And there's this kind of underlying tension. And that's interesting for me. Um, that's really interesting for me because it obviously uh, is quite a global moment. And it's an interesting moment where global and Indian creators are on the same page, which is quite exciting in, in even in a, in a depressing sort of manner. Um, and I think as a festival, like I said, for us, I think we just felt like maybe like even Irini was saying that it is a time to reflect on what you've been doing. And maybe it's almost like a great time for incubating new ideas, but maybe not necessarily acting on them. Um, because one of the reasons, like, for example, just to share why we didn't go digital this year is just that we felt like that there's so much noise and competition out there right now not just for us but in general for just screen time and creators are just going nuts trying to you know find their next job or, or promote themselves and there's just so much like and it's good to do it but as a festival it just almost means like it almost feels like there's a giant festival on instagram happening anyways so why do another festival that tries to curate inside that and it just feels too messy so that was just a reason tactical reason why we didn't do it but I think for us, the, uh, the focus on just creating groups of people, smaller groups of people, which you don't advertise about, but really go back to our roots in the underground scene, so to speak. I mean, you know, in 2005, 2006, what state the electronic music scene was with no money, no equipment, nothing. We're really there right now again. And it really is, is time. And I think it's an exciting time. At the end of the day, when you have nothing, amazing things come out of that. When you have everything, you're too spoiled for choice. And for me, it's just almost like revisiting where we came from. And, and that's the general spirit with, with what we're doing. And I think just in terms of digital concerts and venues, obviously there's a huge proliferation. If you, I mean, there's some really crap examples like Book My Show trying to become like a virtual conference setup. I don't know if anyone's seen that. Or uh, obviously very high end, like Tomorrowland or whatever, right? Creating these amazing virtual reality uh, festivals on the Unreal Game Engine. Um, there's obviously this huge growth of like things like virtual production and so on and filmmaking. So there's obviously a lot of exciting technologies which have essentially accelerated. And, and just to give you a great example, right? I mean, if you look at what, uh, some of you might be familiar with what digital humans are in recent times. Now, I was working on a project on digital humans in January of this year, proposing it to some big partners and everybody felt it was too early, you know, it's too early to talk about digital humans, but cut to six months, seven months and digital humans are the number one trend if you're a 3D creator, if you're a service provider. And so that kind of acceleration is quite fascinating. And I'm quite excited to see, like Irini mentioned, what's the hybrid that comes out. Let's say, let's say we cut to January of 2022. What is this kind of crazy mix and cocktail of what we were used to, what we've adopted right now in a crazy pace, what's left over after that um, and kind of where we are. So yeah, I'm just looking forward to Jan 2022 is when I kick back into action, I think. When the coronavirus vanishes miraculously, which everyone's know. dream, everyone's dream. Um, yeah, I think that uh, we're going to open up to the fellows and um, 
uh, yeah, we can do that. But uh, while everyone's kind of um, streaming in, I want to pick up on something that um, I think Avinash, you mentioned several times, um, and which is this issue of terminology that I think we are perennially faced with um, as people who run fe as festival directors, or, you know, I think um, because of various reasons, audience expectations, artistic practice, uh, academic or art historical discourse, and of course funding, um, I think forces us in some ways to fit or define what we show. Like, I'm always expected to explain what experimental film is or isn't, and you know, um, video art, is it moving image art? So I, I always try to use all the terms together to confuse the matter right. even further. Um, <laughs> Because I think that um, I also think that that's the face, the space that the that experimenta inhabits. It's very much about you know blurring the boundaries between different image practices instead of like fitting into just one. So how do you deal with terminology um, thinking in your festival exhibition context? Because um, you know how often are you confronted with this question of what is it? Is it media art, digital art, tech art? You know, um, and I I'm you know I'm always and I also teach and you know I have a lot of students who will you know come and ask me I want to do tech art and I'm like you know uh, what is that or um, new media and, and I think that there's particular trajectories of particular practices but there's always this expectation as of someone who runs an exhibition or a festival to have the definition um, I don't know Avinash do you want to kind of talk about your experience maybe sure absolutely I mean I think one of the, I mean, uh, on a more smaller level, one of the, obviously, the nomenclature issues is like, is it AR or VR or XR or IR or, you know, uh, or uh, yeah, immersive media and so on, right? I mean, that kind of discussion itself explains a lot about the general confusion that's there in, in brands, in, in audience goers, in creators themselves and so on. And at a larger lens, I think this whole, I mean, for us personally, we've just settled on media arts right now because we felt like that was a broad definition which encompassed all the things we were talking about and it also was simple enough to kind of just put together as two words for an audience to kind of get a sense of uh, but yeah I mean honestly I, like you said we just use a lot of different nomenclature because this I mean part of it is obviously that there's such fragmented audiences right I mean if you look at code based art and as a curator looking to find amazing pieces of work made by Indians, it's A, it's so hard to locate in spite of the internet, in spite of such a big boom in work, it's actually still very hard to locate pieces of work that would qualify in some ways as creators saying that, you know, this is what I'm doing. Um, and if you look at further like sub genres like noise music, now that has no meaning for the average club goer. So when you call someone for a noise music evening, I mean, I'll give you a great example. At one of the old IMITs in, I think, 2013 at the Goethe Institute, we had these amazing noise musicians from Switzerland. Um, and after two hours of them performing, one really irate audience member came to me and said, when are they going to finish the warm-up? Right? So the issue just being that there is kind of like, I mean, we're in, I mean, and I think part of it is also, I have to look at myself and say that this is actually a problem with me at times or us at times that we're also in a way, you know, growing up in this kind of one foot in the East, one foot in the West kind of a situation as a creator, as a curator, you also tend to sometimes bring in, I don't know, your own notions of what you feel is contemporary electronic music or what you feel is contemporary media arts. And often it's at huge end, it's at huge odds with uh, what the public here wants. And I'm not saying that we need to make a mass consumption media arts festival. I think by its very nature, even media arts festivals abroad are a niche event. So it's not like it's some kind of a stadium bursting event when you do an electric noise music concert in Switzerland, right? It's still gonna be a hundred people, 200 people, but hundred people in India doesn't cut it for a brand, right? They want a thousand people. So for example, when you go to, go to a media arts festival in Europe, you're actually okay with being in a cinema hall with just seven or eight people watching, you know, film from the 1920s, non-narrative film from the 1920s for like, with just 15 people and you come out and see what an amazing exhibition but here if you have a cinema hall with 15 people sitting on it it's a complete disaster so i'm not saying one is good or bad but i think one has to accept and also respond to just your own culture and and, and try to unpack unpack that a little better 
I think Irini, you seem to have like the opposite thing because yeah. I, I don't think numbers is really uh, something that, you know, you'll necessarily have to deal with um, in the way that, you know, the expectation here when you do something and need funding from brands and stuff. Um, but, uh, and also on the, other, on the other hand, I think that, you know, in, 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 in our context, um, the discourse around kind of, this area of practice, academic and art historical is few and far between. I mean, it's happening, there's writing, there's a lot of, but it's it's not um, kind of as structured, I think, as it is in, let's say the UK in terms of like how, you know, um, there are uh, mas masters and, you know, you're doing courses in this in undergrad and stuff in, in your, in art school. So, which is a whole other burden um, so that you are already kind of fixed in um i don't know what do you, what are your thoughts on this yeah i think you uh, very rightly you brought up education because education is like a, a very big factor in terms of how we categorize um you know all the art forms in a way and i think it's just like that artists now have we see like more artists who have been kind of going like through um you know from one medium to the other and so it's not it, it, it doesn't make sense so much anymore i mean like i usually just I, I try to avoid like just to kind of use the term art and then leave it to the creators to decide like which you know medium they want to experiment or work with and or how they want to kind of label themselves because it's not uh, you know in terms of like curatorial practice from my perspective i've always found really interesting to go back to history to bring in historical examples for example yeah but with kind of contemporary work but also mm. um, work from different art forms and mediums and how they talk to each other or like you know what what people say so so rather than staying in the in in the medium in terms of trying to kind of you know just uh, yeah limit the the discussion there but uh, but I think uh, yeah as, as you're saying like there, there are so many like again it is to do with education and creating like these niche categories and like, of course, like masters and like specializations, et cetera. But, uh, but again, now we're seeing that universities are going to a different direction and trying to bring people together from different sectors and different disciplines, because of course it's really important. We see that in many artistic practices, uh, interdisciplinary kind of approaches are very important. And it's something that many artists are, are just you know are doing are following but also the it's it's kind of we see a lot of collaborations and cross kind of disciplinary collaborations happening so so it is so i think like it's something that it's kind of you know we are leaving behind probably we'll see <laughs> Okay, I think that uh, we have the fellows here. So um, if you have questions that you would like to ask, um, please go ahead. Yeah, um, Thomas. Yeah. Yeah, hello, hello, hello. Uh, uh, first of all, thanks very much for this really nice uh, insights into your practice and the work was really inspiring to see. And now I want to kind of continue the the, the direction that uh, we already have had, like in the past ten minutes. Um, as an artist, of course, I'm in the situation right now, as so many others, where you know, lots of uh, event shows and festivals got cancelled uh, this year, right, um, or postponed to next year, and um, yeah, everybody is kind of waiting and trying to sit this out. Um, but for me personally, for example, um, I kind of had a, like a similar strategy, strategy to like Avinash that where I feel like rushing into this whole digital only format is kind of not really like, it feels like too much right now. And it also doesn't reflect my artistic practice and my interest. So um, what I do is I work on this intersection of physical and virtual space, right? Um, especially during COVID, I came up with like a new approach for my work where I combine um, um, spatial um, installation, sculpture installation with um, augmented reality elements and artificial intelligence. So, of course, uh, the question to me is like, well, will I ever be able to like, show that uh, again, you know? So, um, 
my question is what kind of like long-term strategies um, are you guys thinking of um, in case yeah the situation doesn't change and for those that are left behind when there's only like digital uh, only formats you know it's kind of like is there any other kind of like i don't know remote work possible and also what kind of advice do you have for artists that are in this dilemma um irini you want to uh, is it for me or specifically or for either one of us no to anyone, to anyone. anyone. Yeah. even Irene, Arjun, you know, wanna you want to hit that first so oh uh, do you yeah do you want me to go first yeah yeah okay um Yeah, hi Thomas. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's a, that's a very valid concern that you have, and it's something that we've been kind of exploring as well. I mean, in terms of how um, not just Future Everything, but also other organizations who work at the moment, it's one thing that came, became very evident is that the need to support artists at this time. And uh, obviously here in the UK, for example, there were a lot of, uh, you know, relief uh, grants for uh, arts organizations, for collectives, but not for individuals like and artists. And it's, it's in, in a way, it makes us think that, you know, we wouldn't, arts, organi or arts organizations wouldn't exist if artists don't have support right to produce work and create work so so fortunately like for at the moment like for example what we are thinking is um, yeah i mean we are working with artists we, we've been working on a project for a festival called barnaby uh, which is very close to manchester and it's um, and it's mainly working with artists who have always shown work in a physical format and even with with digital work with technological kind of you know uh, approaches they've always shown in a physical format and we're trying for example to create online profiles for them like to you know networking spaces where they can become more you know they their work can become more visible that they can get opportunities to to get um I don't like commissions, for example, but also there are like at the moment, uh, you know, ways that so, some organizations are creating like online residencies or like micro commissions or allowing artists to work from their own spaces so that, you know, they, they don't have to go um, like in, in a specific like space to, to create work. But also another thing that we've been kind of um, looking at is the public space you know, outdoor spaces. And I mean, depending on where you are, there are uh, so many, um, you know, opportunities, as you say, like physical work that combines like uh, AR or like, you know, AI or different layers. Uh, we've been trying to work in similar ways, for example, to with uh, exploring spaces around the city where we still go out and how we can engage people there. Um, but also how we can from now on create more art, you know, artistic development opportunities. And I know this doesn't kind of answer maybe specifically, but it's just like, I think one, one thing that has, um, I found really inspirational is like how many artists have been starting their own ways to create spaces, to present their work, you know, using different uh platforms and mediums as i said before even post uh, like or even uh, whatsapp messaging or like social media or even like you know public spaces where they can create posters and you can uh, use ar or uh, other kind of layers to to develop work so i think it's something that would be great you know and you, it is you have the power to continue to do and um yeah and inspire like people to to get there and kind of do the same um, from our side, I think some of the things I could add to it is one is that I think in India, at least for the Indian context, it's definitely maybe a very, very hard time for artists who kind of, let's say, self-identify as just as, as full-time artists. It's a very difficult time uh, purely because as it is, the art ecosystem is very poor in India. And with the current crisis, obviously any smaller forms, uh, for example, for people who might not be Indian here, just to give you a quick idea, most of the funding that art, contemporary artists might get in India might actually come from international cultural uh, grant organizations, right? Obviously, they have their own troubles right now, and that's obviously limited. So I think for me, I think it's almost like a cathartic moment for artists in, and you have to, I mean, you have to accept that it's a totally crap situation and there's nothing available. And in many ways, Hopefully, a lot of artists will find 
strength in that in some ways. And like Irini is mentioning, find new ways to collaborate. And this really, I think it's in a, in a positive manner, one should look at it as the manner in which most great art was born. It was born in crisis. It was born in tough situations. Art communities were built without funding, without support. And I think if one can imagine yourself and uh, in that situation, then making great art might not be a problem. But if one is feels susceptible to feeling overpowered by that, then it's a very difficult situation. So I think for me, the only way to make art is in the head right now and to somehow stick to your guns and hold on. And obviously, you know, I, my studio Quicksand, like for example, I'm right now also working on a project on clinical trials for COVID uh, with the Welcome Trust, right? So I'm quite deeply involved in the actual crisis itself. And there are no good indications, right? It's going to go on for a while. And any person who's reading anything knows it's going to go on for a year and a half, maybe more. And so the point is that if that's true, then how do you build yourself up with very frugal resources? And for me as an Indian artist, I feel like one of the great inspirations is obviously, you know, the, the, art, the unknown artisans and the unknown craftspeople of this country, the unknown performers and the unknown folk artists of this country, what they've dealt with over the years with very frugal resources and what they've dealt with in the last four or five decades with extremely frugal resources. One has to understand and appreciate that journey and maybe learn from that and apply that to yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I would say I think the way to go is just low tech, you know, and I think that uh, low tech is we do it well in, in low brow, low tech, um, low tech and DIY. So, I, I mean, you know, and it's uh, I mean, there's enough ways of, of uh, showing uh, low tech stuff. So I just think it's a realignment of how we're, um, you know, making work um, to uh, I think that. And just in continuing with this, uh, Ambika Joshi, do you want to ask your question or should I ask it for you? Um, okay, maybe. I mean, I think so. So there's a question here by Ambika Joshi that basically says that now that so many festivals are moving online, do you think it will become more important to have a strong online presence? Um, and that is not just social media. And will artists' works have to focus on creating with web focus? Um, just in continuation of what we're talking about. What do you think about that, you guys? Um, is web focus going to have to be a thing, maybe? Um, should I go Anyone? first? Or, or yeah, 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 go, go for, for it. it. Yeah. Oh, I can just add a couple of points on it because we have been discussing. I think it's inevitable that you need to do it, but like Irini was mentioning before, there's, I think, this threshold beyond which it just it just will become insipid and flat and dry and not at all relatable to the human experience of art uh, and what I think I mean, one has to appreciate I think and go much deeper for me into the idea that art is not an industry or a product right it's not it's 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 developed from very inner human senses and and and, and it's a way to connect to nature it's a way to connect to each other right and so it's in a way unfair to even expect that artistic practices and truly sensorial immersive art and emotional art will actually have anything of a future on a flat screen on the internet. So um, yeah, that's my point of view on it. And it's, I think it's okay as an intermediary step right now in a crisis. And I think like what Irini was mentioning earlier, just totally on board with that, that let's just wait it out and see what kind of a mutant hybrid comes out at the end of it. Yeah, that's 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 right. But I totally agree. But also, and we 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 also forget that. I mean, we jumped into uh, very quickly when the whole thing happened to start creating things online, and there was a pressure. At least uh, I know, like from some countries, there was a pressure put on artists like to start creating things online, which is actually it's not it's not necessary at the end. It depends on like how what you do, like as an artist, what what is where is your audience, like what is your priority. You don't have to go online. I mean, if you we know like this has always happened like artists have created from like very small group for, for like very small groups of people to just even no one <laughs> like and then so so it's just something that I think it's quite personal as well I wouldn't um, I don't think that it's necessary necessary to kind of suddenly all be online it doesn't make sense for a lot of work to be on to, to be shown online it's it, and we don't have to to make it like that 
Okay, thanks. Um, I think Alistair has a question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, you're on mute, yeah. yeah um, link back to something Avinash, you were saying about um, the wealth of unknown folk practitioners. I was wondering how, if at all, this experience has made any of you think differently about uh, the local, um, especially as the recent trend in the art world has been this proliferation of another triennial and another art fair, this kind of super international and globalized network, and particularly um, under the weight of the <laughs> climate catastrophe, how maybe this period of time is making anyone feel differently about the local? Absolutely, that's a great question. And one of my favorite phrases of late is the hyper-local hyper is the new hyper-global, right? Um, uh, and, but in terms of just specific, two examples come to mind, which I think illustrate this well. One is an example of the, of the great designer Ettore Soas, who was the originator of the Memphis movement. And one of the lesser known stories about his about the Memphis style itself is that it actually originated in his trip to India, to South India, where he visited a small town, uh, which is well known for people painting their own homes in these amazing art deco, vibrant kind of color patterns. And if you, he basically came back from that trip and interpreted that as Memphis, and that's why Memphis suddenly came out of the blue, right? And this was known much later. And, and so that illustrates, and obviously everyone knows how big Memphis is, in fact, in 2019, Memphis was one of the key trends in fashion in most of the fashion magazines and trend books, right? The second example is obviously Picasso and understanding how his art had a lot to do with African masks and more primitive cultures and expressions. And knowing that, so I think both these examples illustrate something very simple, which is that what we feel is native, what we feel is folk, what we feel is local and small actually has the power to shape the whole world in terms of aesthetics, not only in that generation, but in generations to come. And I feel we should take that very seriously. And I mean, just as an Indian creator, for me, you know, going to design school, like in this case, looking at Memphis when I was 17, 18, and thinking, wow, Europeans must be so amazingly cool to come up with this kind of furniture. And then when I'm 40, realizing that it came from the state that I belong to is a kind of a very interesting thing to think about. And I feel like as an Indian practitioner, there is just unlimited options to go deeper into your culture, into the fabric of your society. And I feel like a moment like this is a really a call to action to young creators or any age of creators in India to really reflect on that and, and build a whole new era of media art on the back of your own culture. And I think this is the, this is the time to do it. Uh, Irini, do you have a response or? We're good. Um, I, yeah, I don't. I don't think that I need to add anything. Okay. I mean, I've been asked to put that in a, such a nice, eloquent way. So. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, I think Diane has a question. Um, yeah. Uh, I wrote something um, in the question and answer part earlier, but I'm not so interested in asking that because I think we've sort of gone through uh, that question. Um, but it was more about the separation of showing artists working digitally or electronically. It, there's often like a separation of a show with that sort of art and then the rest of our other art forms. But I think you, we kind of, you spoke about that, Irene, a bit earlier. Um, but one thing I, I was thinking about was um, when thinking about environmental change and, you know, crisis, um, where do you see a place for like tech artists or artists that work digitally or um, in relating, like in sort of talking about that um, in relation to the fact that the tech industry itself is like the, the idea of like progress and forever growth um, going on and on and the, um, which seems quite counterproductive to reducing CO2 emissions and production. And how as a tech artist or an artist that works with these tools, which I don't know. I just wondered whether you had any examples of artists that are doing so, like talking about environmental change, crisis, blah, 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 but dig with digital tools and how they navigate that or whether we shouldn't worry about it. <laughs> we should just use whatever medium um, is most effective to talk about that. Um, Irini? Irini, do you want to take that? 
Oh. Yeah, again, no, that's that's a really interesting question. I know we should definitely worry about that. It's a huge, it's a huge issue, and uh, and it's really interesting that you are bringing up that in terms of you know when, especially if we work with technology and um, and like even machine learning, we are online now more than ever. All these have an environmental impact, and sometimes we don't realize because we don't think about the tactility and the physicality of these actions in, in a way. Um, but everything like servers, like everything are kind of physical, they occupy physical spaces. So, so it's something that we, we definitely need to address. I mean, something that we were thinking about, for example, uh, last year, long before the, the pandemic was how we were going to you know, just you move some of our kind of uh, work online just to kind of avoid having people flying over from across the world for events, etc. But also now we are thinking about, you know, the environmental impact that these online encounters have as well. And it's and it's there are many artists actually that work with ideas like that. Like for example, I don't know, Julian Oliver is a great example of somebody who has been addressing um, work uh, like this. But uh, Cassia Molga as well. Who is thinking about environment like there, there are so many so so many examples um and it's and, and it's something that i think i mean I, i'm not sure how this is going to to be tackled in a way if we continue to kind of you know be like technologically kind of uh, advanced and like work like this but it's something that also the industry is kind of starting to think about i mean at future everything we we've we've start we, we have like been starting to have conversations with industry in terms of like how we can um, rethink about repair, how we can think about recycling and, you know, in terms of devices. I mean, in India has a really uh, interesting work in terms of and a huge kind of um, skills in terms of repair culture as well. And in the UK, there are organizations like the, the Restart Project who are doing really interesting work in terms of creating these bridges between thinking about um, you know, craft and like making, but repair as well, and talking to kind of policymakers. So, and and again, they are they are moving in this kind of design, art, and like um, technology worlds as well. So, artists have a lot to to offer in that in terms of conversations and uh, and views. So, so yeah, I mean, I can I can share some some links from artists as well if that's if that's helpful. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Maybe that's, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe you can share that with Archana and then she can uh, pass them on. I want to take a question that is, I, I think, an important and interesting question um, in response to this idea of uh, working in the local. Um, I think that the question is, where is the line between inspiration and appropriation, especially in this global versus local discussion? Um, um, Avinash, do you want to take that? Because I mean, you know, you did talk about working um, with the local, with folk and things like that. So how does one negotiate, you know, these boundaries between inspiration and appropriation? Really? Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously many answers and it's like a continuum of like uh, debatable answers and conflicting kind of ideals in that. I can just speak on a couple of points from my own experience. One, I think what comes to mind is my experience as a visual jockey. And obviously, if anyone's familiar with also disc jockeying and visual jockeying, the early years of both of these professions are all about sampling and reappropriation, right? That's what the culture, that's what the practice is built on. Um, now, as those industries evolve, there comes to be this distinction between, I'm not a DJ, I'm a music producer, I'm not a VJ, I'm a, I'm a visual artist, right? And that distinction helps you understand how what the changing code of morality might be in these kind of occupations, right? And, and I think it applies equally to other kinds of uh, trajectories uh, in the electronic arts or even in AI and, and, and the recent work in ML and so on. For example, a lot of the early machine learning work coming from India in the last years has just been reappropriating code bases to create new forms of art and at, at the level of a very surface aesthetic, it's not really going deeper. Now you see more examples. So, I think at some level, one has to accept that all new art forms and media arts practices at some level will start their journey with a more highly, more high on the appropriation and exploitation kind of front. And as they become mature as industries, as more global attention comes to them, those artists and creators will find a way to be, let's say, more original 
in a more uh, acceptable manner, let's say. Um, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it, I think, is just that we have to, uh, I, I, it's a very hard thing to unpack, right? I mean, I, and I think the, the second part that really comes to mind is uh, like, I'm a professionally trained designer. I went to a fashion school. And one of the big things we do in a fashion school is obviously work with local artisans, right? Now, that process of interacting with the local, whether it's an artisan or in my other studio case where we do human-centered design and we do a lot of ethnography, we meet, we meet, you know, several sections of the population who do not have great resources at their, uh, uh, you know, at their disposal. The idea is still that that negotiation between someone like myself and someone at the base of the pyramid, so to speak, or someone who's a folk artist, is something that can easily be extremely exploitative in my favor by the very nature of the dynamics of education or the dynamics of some wealth of the dynamics of uh, me having an application for that art while an artisan might not even have an application for his art. And I can personally say that in the last 20 years that I've been working, I have definitely traversed and been in some situations which I reflect on and feel like I could have been better at, at addressing that imbalance. And I feel like in the work that we do right now, we're trying to address it. And for me, addressing it means not so much being attached to the idea of creating art, but being more attached and putting more focus on the conditions within which art is made. And for me, creating those conditions, creating enabling conditions for whoever enters a project, whether they're less educated or more, whether they're an artisan or a new media artist, creating that environment for work and the conditions for that work is a far more important and highly artistic activity compared to the actual work of making an artwork. So I don't know if that was too abstract, but hopefully Irini could add to it or if that made sense. Yeah. No, I think that was that, that makes perfect sense. Just to add very briefly that like the uh, a recent like the recent the design justice book, for example, like it says it, it says that design is something that we can all do, right? That because it's some it's how we solve and problems and we respond to challenges. But actually the people who get paid for, for doing to do design are very few and it's about value as well it's that as you were saying Abinas it's just like that certain people have access to that and it's addressing this and decolonizing these spaces I think is really important right now so and and especially with you know we do the same thing with digital spaces there, there is like a uh, like you know a, a weight on like western you know western ways of thinking and talking and the language that is used on all the spaces that we use is very you know it below it's kind of comes from a very small elite so how do we break that and how do we make this more open so that uh, ideas that have been born by other people like they they get kind of valued there rather than being passed to um, you know whoever has access to make them like on their own absolutely i have another just a great example on what this what you said for example if some of you might be familiar with the technique of photogrammetry which is basically taking a whole bunch of pictures of, a, of an actual object and the software kind of chucks out a 3d model of a very high resolution which is pretty much an exact duplicate of that now let's say you go to a craft village where there's an old chariot from 300 years back right you do photogrammetry and you put it in, inside a video game now, and you earn thousands of dollars on it, right? Now, the question is, how does that village and the anonymous craft people and the people and the generations of people of his family and that village and that craft community benefit from the hundreds of thousands of dollars that you make on a video game, right? Now, that for me is this kind of essential paradox right now of a new media practitioner that if you want to connect to the local, then how are you going to do it in situations like that? And for me, those are the really interesting aspects where art and ethics cannot be separated if you're a practitioner who's choosing to go down that route. You know, if you want to sit at home and work on computers and make some art, that's great. But if you want to step into the real world and deal with real people, then you cannot leave ethics out of it. And that's an extremely hard and long journey. And I think everyone has to find their place in it. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that the power dynamic, I mean, I think one has to be really conscious of the power dynamics, um, you know, um, in any of these relationships or so-called collaborations. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I think funding also plays a huge role in terms of how these relationships are like, the dynamics between these, in these relationships, like you mentioned. Um, so I wanted to ask, 
um, you know, just taking it into another realm and just kind of concluding because I know that there are a lot of uh, fellows who would be interested to know about this, but what is the space for funding? I mean, there's one context where there's grants. Um, obviously, they're very different in the West versus in India. There's one more context for grants, so you can apply to make your work. And then there's the other context where of showing. Um, and is there a possibility once we are kind of miraculously through this COVID universe in how many years from now for um, work like this to be acquired? Uh, what is the what is the what is the uh, what is the context of acquisition by like museums and galleries? Um, you know, how is value determined for this kind of work? you know, is really what I'm trying to go to. Like, how does a gallery determine how to price something, for example? You know, is there a market, like an art market for this kind of work, you know? And I'm just trying to respond to um, something that I'm sure fellows would be thinking through, you know? Um, besides getting funding and grant make, you know, grants for you to make your work, what about, you know, this great realm of, acquisition of artwork that particular kinds of visual arts seem to have access to, but not necessarily work like this that might be more ephemeral or, you know, uh, tech uh, dependent. Um, would either one of you, I mean, Irini, maybe you have some, I mean, I don't know, with the, with the, with the VNA, maybe you have some experience of this? Um, I, it, it is, a, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's still like a very nebulous area, I find, but especially with like, if you, if for artists whose, whose work involves like uh, te technology, it's it's quite, um, it's quite a challenging um, a part. I mean, one thing that museums often think about in terms of acquisition is like what, how, like looking at your work in many, many years, like time, like what happens to it, uh, you know, can you imagine your work in a hundred, in a hundred years, I'm mean, like 200, like 300. So they're trying to think about like, you know, the long term um, kind of state of conditions of, of work if they have to care for it in, in the longer term. So so I think it's, I mean, there are examples of artists like Rafael Lozano is a, is a is a good example of an artist who has been always, um, I mean, not always, but he has kind of uh, established a, a really interesting kind of, you know, methodology and procedure for like thinking about his work and how it is cared for in the long term. And I think, I think he, he has like online kind of, you know, guidelines about how he does that. So for example, putting instructions, but also so for the person who kind of, you know, takes your work or like acquires your work, whether that is a museum or a, or a private collector, et cetera, or a gallery and what they can do, for example, to care for it in the long term. So what kind of, so it's, it's some sort, I mean, something that I usually advise artists to, to think about is, um, yeah, just to, when you create work to think about it, uh, in, in the long term, so you might start with a prototype, but then how do you, you know, create something that is, um, you know, that you see as a as a more permanent kind of um, artwork? And also, it's like what kind of contract do you create between yourself and the person who uh, decides to to take your to buy your work and to live with it for a very long time? So how you are going? Maybe you might decide to support it, like I don't know, to to create uh, space for you to kind of. Um, you know, step in when there is an issue or like give guidelines, etc. So I think it's, but also in terms of like, in terms of prices, I, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure because it changes so much. And it's kind of something that usually artists do is to kind of do a bit of research in terms of what is out there in the market, like in terms of similar work and how it is priced. Um, but also in terms of how galleries and museums, uh, you know, uh, like look for work or like, um, De decide on what work to, 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 to show, or I guess it's first establishing a relationship with an artist, but also, um, but, but also like it, all these depend so much on, on so many factors, for example, how much exposure you have, like who kind of promotes your work, etc. And it's something that I find that curators have a responsibility to kind of give opportunities but to artists and like go beyond like you know a circle that they usually 
you know that that you might know so so yeah so i think it's something that uh, I, I, it's a two way thing so it's a responsibility for uh, museums and collectors and sorry and curators to think long term and to think about you know what stories are you trying to tell absolutely yeah i totally agree. Avinash, you, yeah yeah i totally agree with her and just to add some maybe nuances from the indian context and also just juggling my memory of my attempts to be like a media artist trying to sell my stuff, which was a total failure, just because, you know, because uh, there are some very unique things that come into play, right? Like exactly what Irini is saying, like, uh, you know, how do you unpack a video art piece that I made right now, which let's say uses a Arduino kind of processor and a few other things and bits and bobs and is packaged into something. What, what happens when you open it 20, 30 years from now in the house of an old industrialist who just passed away with this giant collection of new media art, right? It's not gonna work most probably in, in many ways and, and you won't be able to update it and there'll be a software issue on the display and so on and so forth. So I think the really interesting part for me is that if you look at, again, pre-cinema, like the late 1800s, early 1900s and the media arts that were developed then, you can still unpack them and play with them. You can still view them they're in, in, in the same condition and the experience is the same. But in high contrast, you know, cut to 120 years with the greatest of technology, all we can create is unfortunately very ephemeral pieces of art. So I think there's an inherent contradiction there. And, and I think as new media practitioners or media practitioners trying to create art that will survive acquisition, uh, there are, I think, different kinds of models. One of the models that comes to mind is this kind of subscription kind of a model that you can update content over time and that becomes this kind of like a, uh, and you can provide like essentially uh, what you would call in hardware terms as, uh, you know, service and maintenance contract around your art. Uh, but the point is, do you really want to do that? I mean, you know, you make something when you're 30, do you really want to service and maintain that same crap when you're 45? Maybe not, right? So. Uh, that's kind of one big issue. Uh, the other issue I feel is the lack of, in, at least in India, of collectors or acquirers, so to speak, right? Who, who understand. I know that there are only a very small handful of video art collectors in this country, and maybe two or three of them have the chunk of all the stuff made that's, you know, buyable or whatever uh, out for uh, sale. And even, you know, in terms of its value and appreciation compared to other predominant forms of visual arts, there's absolutely no value in appreciation, right? I mean, of that cost. So as a collector, there's actually not too many incentives for you to be a collector of media arts because there's no business model around it, right? So that's again, the other aspect, which is creates other kinds of complications. And lastly, I just feel like, like Irene is saying, right? You, it's really a two way process and, and, and uh, you know, for example, if you look at Bombay Airport, right now, that's the most unlikely possibility for a giant art and, and, and traditional art museum and craft museum, but it is the biggest museum in India of that sort. Uh, and it's done an amazing job with its curation, right? Uh, and creation as well. Now, I guess in some ways one has to hardwire yourself into certain infrastructure projects. So for example, there have been many projects come my way over the last years where there's an industrialist who's starting his new showroom and the architect is a modern architect and he's convinced him that media arts is the thing to invest in as the thing that makes your place look modern. And so they have like 10 commissions of a giant kind of sum that then gets distributed to different media artists. Now, again, there are a lot of examples of people doing these kind of scale of installation, which are like permanent fixtures, like Irene is saying, and, and in a sense, you become part of the interior design of a place. Now, again, that's a call that individual artists need to make, right? Do you really, do you want to be an interior designer? Uh, and are you okay with that? Do you need the money? Are you cash strapped and you need to make a killing on somebody else's money in a big factory then, and you get the budgets to explore some amazing piece of art, which you would never get budgets for. Um, and the last example I'd like to give from my own experience is totally off tangent, but it's about the Indian wedding scene now, as a VJ trying to earn money to bootstrap my own video game over the last year. I've done, you know, stuff at Indian weddings, you know, like visuals and installations. And surprisingly, however crass that sounds, it's actually been some of my best kind of work in some ways because the budgets that you have are insane and everybody's only out to outdo the other wedding. And you actually get so much room and such a big canvas to play on that nothing I do on the club scene or at a music festival compares. So, you know, Blessings come in many forms, and I think individual artists need to make their make their sort of whatever take their decisions around this kind of stuff. Cool, thank you, thank you both. That was really inspiring. Um, I think there were lots of um, 
lots of points there for everyone to think about. There were a couple of things that I thought that maybe the fellows could like take forward. I don't know if you're already addressing these things, but this idea that I think Irini brought up, or not idea, or this practice that she's involved with, with Future Everything about, you know, having uh, critical conversations around technology and, and looking towards you know, policy and research and study around technology, because I think that that's a consciousness, especially where we're at now that we have to have, um, especially where we're at now politically across the world. Um, and the direct and the connection between technology and this new bureaucracy, or this capitalist new bureaucracy that Irini kind of just talked about. So I think that um, maybe uh, you know, these could be discussions that you take forward over the next days of your fellowship. So thanks, Irini, Abhinash, and all the fellows. Um, it's been fun. And Arjuna and Kamya. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Great to meet you all. That's great. On behalf of Bangalore Fantastic and Arjuna and the fellows, I really, really thank Shai and Irini and Abhinash for spending such a hearty amount of time. I think we're uh, 13 minutes over time, but nobody even thought that. And I think we're, we're ready to keep going. The timekeeper wasn't stopping us right now. But, um, and what I think jumps out both with the speakers on the panel, but also all the fellows in our room is, uh, and something that kind of talks to Bangalore Fantastic and the effort that it's trying to do is this idea of the edge effect. I think we're all on the edges of a certain practice and that demands us to be very critical thinking and bearing a lot of the, the energy that comes our way to push ahead and push forth. Um, I don't want to use the word pioneers, but you know, like we're kind of pushing that and nudging and creating that niche for ourselves, and it takes tremendous energy. So uh, we can see that from your presentations, uh, your practices, and we can feel that in the room with all the fellows as well. So uh, it's been a fabulous coming together of edge effect, this kind of energy, and I really, really thank you for your time and blessings over here. So. Um, yeah, with that, thank you and good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye all. What are we doing? Whew.